I've just discovered a new website that I freaking love. You ready? It's then? called Public Domain Superheroes. All right, you ready? And um, we're talking about From the Bridge today. It's a documentary. It's going to be up next up on Geek Out SA. Check it out. Welcome back to Geek Out is Say. We're Friday and we're having fun. Or it's Friday and we're having technical difficulties having as technical usual. Difficulties. No, we're good. Well, I mean, it's not a technical technical it's a difficulty. difficulty. It's our producer is technically not here, <laughs> so that's a pretty big technical difficulty. <laughs> Thank I guess you. So, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a human technical. It's a difficulty. human technical difficulty. So I have my buddy here, Phil that, Nelson that from Nelco Media. Which I've, try, I've been trying to get you on for the longest time. And fi we finally got a chance where you, you were free. <laughs> you know, I am so happy to be here tonight just so that I can geek out and play with all your toys. <laughs> because this is every kid's dream and most adults will be jealous. <laughs> yeah, I'm I keep telling Vince we need to do that episode like Cribs where everybody can see. Because we talk about it, but nobody's ever really seen like what it really actually looks like. And then everybody can't really see. We didn't put the camera up high enough so that you could see the balloon, but the balloon is here for a reason. I yes. Said, Vince is the only guy I know over the age of 12 with a full-size stormtrooper balloon in their house permanently. So we're actually dedicating this show to uh, a great family friend. Uh, that passed away. Uh, it was a while back, a but we, ago. we had a, we had a life um, celebration uh, the other night. So uh, he was a big super Star Wars fan. So this is one of the things that they had in there, and they, uh, you know what? Put it on the show, and then talk about him. Talk okay. about Ray, and uh, just yeah, kind of keep his memory keep going. Keep his memory so. alive. So thank you, Ray, for the balloon. Yes. You're a good friend. <laughs> <laughs> but now we get to talk about Phil. Yes. <laughs> So, big news that you uh, you were at San Diego Comic Con. I saw. I was watching you when you went live uh, in in the background during the panel. So you had a panel, but tell us about what the panel was. Well, I'll give a little background. So one of my longtime friends is his name is Spencer F. Lee, and he's a film director. Mm -hmm. And he came up with the concept of doing this documentary from the bridge and asked me to come on as a producer. And I said, heck yeah, dude, this is amazing. So, you know, basically from the bridge is a upcoming documentary that really talks about the origins of fandom mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how they really go back to the era when Carrie O'Quinn created Starlog magazine and Fangoria magazine because yeah. before those magazines came out the horror the sci-fi those communities were kind of underground communities of fans mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they would meet in hotel ballrooms and well it wasn't really popular to be that kind it wasn't, of fan it, wasn't the you cool, were... it was cool to your to your core friends but people were like oh, where are you going this weekend uh, I got a meeting, uh. but they're really going to the <laughs> local Holiday Inn to exchange mimeograph uh -huh. newsletters about yeah. Star Trek. Uh -huh. And so once, you know, Starlog was on the newsstands, it brought these communities together and let people know they weren't alone. Mm -hmm. And that's what Spencer is, has been doing with this documentary is talking about how fandom has gone from an underground community of hardcore fans to one of the most powerful financial consumer bases in the world for movies and mm -hmm. TV shows and toys and comic books. And it's it's now mainstream. Nerds rule the world. Geek out SA. <laughs> Yay! Yeah. Yeah. Nerds win! Yeah. Nerds rule. Revenge of Finally. the Nerds was actually a prophecy. <laughs> yeah. That's right. I'm just kidding. Well, everything has just, it's like that ma magazine opened up earth, the it's world. It's geek shell in her at the earth. Yeah. <laughs> that magazine opened the world to so many people in a way in that time period in a way that it could in the way now that social media and youtube and everything opens it even more 
to us and we can find out things that we never would have found out before and just like you and I were talking about and we can Google it instantaneously and find mm. out information and be even more attracted to it than we were before because we can see the artwork and you know as a kid I was a, I read Starlog I read Fangoria I read Cinemagic I read Comic Scene Magazine and all those magazines were done by yeah. Curio Quinn and that was you know we didn't have the internet so if we wanted to know what's coming those magazines are where you learn. That's where that's where most people first discovered Star Wars. And Fangoria you know? was kind of like frowned upon if you like brought it to school or anything like that. Well, because there's, there's <laughs> blood on the cover. Yeah, <laughs> bloody faces are always frowned upon in schools. You know, you know yeah, even nowadays, it's still not happens. really a thing. It's not something that we do. <laughs> Starlog, you know, Captain Kirk got a, you could get away with that one, but yeah. So to answer your question with a very long answer. You know, Spencer has been a longtime friend and asked me to help uh, produce this documentary. And we were invited, or he was invited, to open San Diego Comic Con this year. The opening panel of San Diego Comic Con in Hall 20, 4,000 person room. It was very surreal to open the Comic Con wow. program. And it said Thursday, and the first thing you saw was from the bridge panel. <laughs> Wow. I mean, I geeked out, and Spencer was on the panel. The It was moderated by Greg Grunberg. Mm -hmm. Do you know who he is? He was Matt yes, Parkman in yes. Heroes. He is in Star Wars. I mean, he's Poe Dameron's wingman, you know? Yeah. I mean, how cool is that? <laughs> you know, he moderated the panel, and you had Spencer Lee. Spencer he's like Lee. in everything that J.J. Abrams does. He or is. Isn't yeah. he? <laughs> Alias, Lost, Well, y'all had a lot of big heroes. names, though. We did. It was an unbelievable panel. I mean, we had, you know, Doug Tate who is a actor who you, you may not recognize him by seeing his face because he's always under prosthetics. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, and I can't really, I can't say much, but he had on a Hellboy shirt on our mm, panel. Nice. nice. Okay, and uh, we had, uh, Carrie O'Quinn was on the panel, the creative star log, and a lot of people don't realize this about Carrie, but he created Star Wars Celebration. Oh, did he really? Yes. He did a 20th anniversary celebration of Star Trek, and they said, well, let's do one for Star Wars for the 10th anniversary. Mm -hmm. So he did, and, and in our documentary, he talked about this in the panel. I'm not giving away anything secret uh -huh. that hasn't been shown yet, because <laughs> this was all stuff talked about in the San Diego Comic-Con panel. But he had, we have video of the first, only time that George Lucas and Gene Roddenberry met. And that was at Celebration, Star Wars 10th anniversary. Wow. So he was on the panel. We had Nichelle Nichols on the panel. Uhura, I can't pronounce her name. Uhura. 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 From Star Trek. <laughs> Star Trek. <laughs> you know, and we had uh, Cecil Grimes on the panel, who is a cosplayer that looks exactly like Rick Grimes. Yes, I've it's, seen that yeah. guy. I've seen that and guy. He funny, really does look like him. Before the panel, we were back in the green room. Mm-hmm. And you may have seen me streaming it, yeah. Um, you know, and just geeking out back there because you know I wasn't on the panel. I was just a producer sitting in the crowd geeking out like everybody else. Mm -hmm. But Cecil Grimes comes in, and Tom DeSanto, who was also on the panel. If you guys are hardcore fans, he was the producer of Transformers, the X Men movie, um, brought Battlestar Galactica back. The guy uh -huh. is a true fan. 42,000 comics in his collection. I mean, he oh, is wow. a hardcore fan. Wow. wow. Yes. <laughs> I told him I want to catch him. <laughs> I only have about 12 boxes of good comics, but wow. he has a lot more than me. <laughs> but uh, Just a little bit. But yeah, so he was on the panel, and it was funny because Rod Roddenberry was also on the panel, Gene Roddenberry's son. son. Wow. Yes. And so Rod was talking to Tom backstage, and Cecil Grimes walks up, and Tom thought it was the real actor and goes, Dude, this is awesome. I've never seen an actor show up for a panel in character. This is great. And then, he's like, <laughs> then he looks at his name badge and goes, Wait, you're Cecil Grimes? And, and it was just really funny. But he looked <laughs> just awesome. like him. And he's like, Dude, that's so awesome that you showed up dressed in character. When you showed me a picture of them side by side, I, I ended up picking it out, but it's hard. It, it, you have to really side, it looks, you you have the real, to really yeah, yeah, look. The real guy. You have to really look at it. But we actually do have a video that we can, uh, if you go to queue up. Well, I'm before try. you queue that, let me add Lynch, our okay. last panelist. Okay. Because okay. we did have one more panelist, the most important panelist on the entire panel. Mm -hmm. George, George A. No is the executive producer of this documentary, and it would not have happened unless he funded this. 
So nice. that is the most important panelist, and we, he, you know, he has a, an alter ego. Mm -hmm. um, he, I, I was actually not supposed to call him George. No, he's actually the man in the hat, because he he was mysterious. He was the man, the man in, the, in hat. the hat. So is he like I, the I guy on Curious George? Identity. The man in the yellow hat. He's like way I'm cooler. <laughs> because he does not have a yellow hat. He was the man in the black hat. Man in the black. And hat. a very cool jacket, and uh, you know, cool dude, man. He lives in Atlanta, and. Uh, he is, you know, he and Spencer are the visionaries behind this project. Nice. I'm just a chump that came in and helped him tactically get some stuff done. That's good. Yeah. That's so good. But you did it right here from San Antonio. So yeah, that's a I good mean, thing. you know, I set up the Stan Lee interview. That was pretty big. Mm -hmm. You know, I, you know, when they needed green screen studios, I called in favors. So George Takei, who is our host. You know, we got Sulu as the host, man. That's pretty sweet. Yes. You know, we got Nichelle and Sulu and, you know, but I set up green screen There's for that. There's nothing like his voice. There's just nothing oh like my. his voice. Yes. <laughs> and I, I wonder if you'll hear him say that in the documentary. I sure hope so. <laughs> it wouldn't right, be a ticket. Sorry, y'all ready for me to cue it up? Hand. So which clip is this? This is Our the one. teaser trailer? This is teaser trailer, yeah. Okay, All right. ready? Here we go. Cue up and then here there we you go. go. To be made fun of as a kid for reading comic books and to see the stuff that I grew up with become the entertainment that rules the world. So all the geeks were finally in charge. We win. Comic fandom has grown. I think it's as big as any fandom in the world. It's a journey that we're making together. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. told me that I was part of history. I understood right then and there what it meant to be a role model. Artists and filmmakers, their works define their times, inspiring millions all over the planet Earth. Horror, sci-fi, fantasy, movies, comic books, the sense of us as a community really started to take hold under the covers of a single magazine called Star Wars. And I was privileged to introduce on stage Gene Roddenberry and George Lucas. It was a historic moment. I was about 17. They needed an assistant in the comics department. Suddenly, Neil Adams shows up. You see some Dead Man pages. It's got realistic facial expressions. It's it was a new idea. It's exciting. It's got all these things that have been missing from comics. There's books. a direct link between the early his outfits and the inhuman comic books. Little by little, I got more involved in writing There's the There's a guy story. in the production room who's cutting up artwork that cuts up one more I page. gave my resignation letter to leave Star Trek. So you want to make it the Pretty and cool, that it? is really cool. I like. That I'm starting to really tear cool. up just from looking at that. I can't wait to see this. And, and, and some of the things that you don't realize because Gene Simmons was in there, and Gene Simmons is a geek. Yes, Gene Simmons is one of us. <laughs> you know, well, and who would have known? You know, it's yeah, funny. Uh, I whenever you know, well, that, that's the when I've talked to people about this documentary, one of the questions I get first is, "Why is Gene Simmons in it?" <laughs> and I was like, "Wait till you see the this documentary," way. because he really is a true fan and you know he is of such a smart guy that mm -hmm. he recognized that his audience uh, were fans of Fangoria magazine and mm -hmm. you know and so Kiss would buy the back cover to yeah. advertise you know so it was really, you know very smart ahead of the you know nowadays you know all these marketers cross promote and they you know everybody has all these analytics but back in the 70s it wasn't quite the science we have today, and yeah. you know he found an audience for Kiss, and you know, and took that prime real estate on the back of Fangoria and rode it all the way. So yeah, it's really exciting. I mean, one of the cool things about the panel um, when Nichelle um, was on the panel, I mean, and she kind of mentions it in that teaser trailer that you saw. I mean, can you imagine season two of Star Trek ends? It gets canceled. A million fans write letters to NBC and say, we want our Star Trek. Like physically write. When yeah, people this don't is not email. It's not an it's email. It's not tweets. It's I wrote it. I figured out what the NBC's executive name was. Wow. I, I put it in the mail, mailed them a letter. They got a million letters. But Nichelle on our panel, and you can actually watch this, and you may want to link to this panel mm -hmm. um, on the, the deal, but you can watch the panel on, on the Comic-Con site. But Nichelle said that 
she said, I quit. I'm not I'm going to Broadway. Yeah. I'm, I'm not going to do this show anymore. I've, I've, it's been there, done that. And Martin Luther King calls her or comes by. He, I don't, it wasn't clear if he came to her or called her or what, but he said, you cannot leave this show. You have to stay on Star Trek. Mm-hmm. You're inspiring. You're, you're a strong, intelligent, you know, Yeah, you're looking at a multicultural mm-hmm. On the cast. bridge of an in- enterprise. And, and, you know, when Dr. King calls, you just have to say, yes, sir, and stay on Star Trek. Yeah. You know, so there, it's just really neat to tell these stories. You know, I, I don't want to give anything away, and I won't, but the Stan Lee interview is studly. Mm-hmm. studly. I mean, it is studly. studly. I mean, because, you know, think about the impact Stan Lee has had on this industry. Yeah. I mean, he was he was at the ground zero for this insanity, you That's, know. And I, and I got to be yeah, close kid. to him twice. And he, yeah, and he <laughs> talks about how he was just 17 years old, right? Yeah. And they just needed a little help, and he was there. It's just the magic of, I was there, it meant something to me, and I kept moving it forward because it meant something to me. And you it know, becomes something huge. It's funny that you say that because, you know, I talked to a lot of schools, and mm-hmm. I, in fact, I spoke at the Art Institute graduation this year. And one of the things I had tell kids is, don't sit at home go out make things happen and be ready for that opportunity because you never really know what door is going to open for you but you have to be ready to walk through it right you know and stan lee was this kid in the right place at the right time which a lot of people are in the right place at the right time but don't walk through the door right they don't and they don't go for the brass ring and so that's something really important i mean you know you have i'm sure a lot of your fans of your show have big ideas Mm-hmm. But a lot of people sit around waiting for their big break. You have to go make your big break. Yeah, because if you, you don't, know, somebody else is going to If you have a come comic book idea, it. start drawing your comic book. Start writing your comic book, you know? Yeah, because look at how many times, if you look at just Stephen King or anybody like that, and all the different times that they've been told no, and they've been pushed away and sent away, but it was their dream and it was important to them. And they believed in it, and so they just kept trying, and they kept going for it. I mean, if Stan gave up every time, like, one of the comics tanked, because they tanked lots of times. There were lots of ideas and characters that people didn't like. If he would have just been like, mm, people don't like my stuff, I'm done. You know, Where you would have to be, be confident, you know, and, and know that sometimes people that are critiques critics are wrong, mm-hmm. you know. <laughs> don't listen to the critics. I mean, uh you know, a friend of mine who's a celebrity said, I don't read any reviews because I don't care what they think. And all they'll do is bring yeah. you down. Yeah, I, I, because I missed out on, I used to miss out on a lot of good movies because I would like listen to the reviews and I don't do that anymore. There's one that that happened to just recently. What was that? Solo. Solo. I loved that movie. People no, were mad that's at what us. I'm saying. Yeah. Solo mad at us. was my favorite Star Wars movie in the last few oh, years. Oh, high five, Phil, right here. <laughs> yes, but <laughs> that all, was good. Yes. all the critics, you know, the trailer it wasn't that good. You know, the trailer wasn't no, wasn't yeah. that good. Yeah. So I didn't think, oh my gosh, I got to see right. Solo. We didn't go in but with then it. all the critics start talking about it's a flop. It hasn't even come out yet, and they're calling it a flop. And so I just wasn't excited about it. And so I did a post on Facebook that said, oh yeah, it's the first Star Wars flop, you know, and I started getting ridiculed by all my visual effects friends in Hollywood saying, hey, don't talk about this movie unless you've seen it. You need to go see it right now. <laughs> and I did, and I was like, I took my, my two daughters that are here with me yeah. tonight, <laughs> sitting in the other room, we went to see Solo, and they were just like, you know how when you're a little kid, and you see a great movie, you feel like you're walking on air when you leave. Yes. That they were like skipping their way out because they yeah. were so they loved this movie so much. And so don't listen to the critics. If you're a fan of Star Wars, don't listen to the critics. Yeah. You know, go see Solo. I mean, it's sad that the lady that, that was in charge of that movie may get canned because of the flaw. When she, you know, Ron Howard is a stud. How can Ron? Ha- I mean, I know. Thank we, you. You know, that's what we were saying. Solo like, <laughs> is one of the modern great Star Wars movies. And in like my when he meets Chewie, and in that whole scene, I mean, come on, how can you not? That is the first time that Vincent and I have ever gotten like actual trolls to hate on us. Why? What they because say? we because did a we show really, where we said gushing, Solo was awesome. And we yes. really liked yes. it. Yes, yeah. and it was the first time we've ever had All people All I have come. to say to those trolls, go crawl back under your bridge and then go see Solo 
and then you will join us in the love of Solo. Well, you and I were talking about it the other day. You don't own fandom. You don't own it. It doesn't belong to you. You well, can love it. You know, here's what I view, my view of trolls. And, you know, most of the time trolls are just people that don't really feel like they have any power. And their only power is to tear somebody else down. Mm -hmm. They're not out there making their own movies. They're not out there making Geek Out SA. They're not out there, you know, they're just criticizing. And you know what? Some things do deserve criticism. Fantastic Four. <laughs> like Flash Gordon. No, I, I, dude, Flash Gordon. I, I love Flash Gordon. I love it, Flash it Gordon. It's the lamest movie ever made. Vincent but it's, loves Flash it's Gordon. It's so like bad it's favorite. good, though. Yeah. You Vincent have to admit, it's, 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 it's so bad it's good. You yeah. know, uh, yeah, I'm ADD, so stream of consciousness. I remember seeing Flash <laughs> Gordon when I was like in the fourth grade. And it was the coolest movie ever made. Mm -hmm. I thought the greatest film, scene in film history at that time was the football fight. Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> go, Flash, go. He's yeah. like beating them. And so this was back before you could watch Super everything cheesy. on Netflix or yes. go to Amazon and buy any movies. So, you know, I fast forward to high school. I'm dating my now wife. And at the rental place, I find Flash Gordon. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is the greatest movie. <laughs> You're going to love this. Never go back, people. Never and go back. she uh, is not a fan of sci fi. She's oh, not no. a fan. She had never even seen Star Wars at the time. And so I put in Flash Gordon, and I was like, uh oh. Uh, <laughs> uh, this she'll is never not talk what I again. remember. But, you know, fortunately, she gave me a second chance. But <laughs> the football fight when you're 18 or 17 is not yeah. as cool as it is when you're in the fourth grade. No. But, you know, sorry, I derailed. It was cool, ba it was cool back you know, then. No, we derailed. All the, time. Was the coolest scene to me as a fourth grade kid was the football fight. And Flash Gordon. Gave me a lifetime fear of sticking my hand in tree stumps. Well, there you go. Yes. And I used to love Did Clash of the Titans. Did you stick your hand in tree stumps as a no. kid? No. No, never. <laughs> Timothy Dalton taught yeah. you a lesson. You know, he won't even admit he's in that movie, but <laughs> he, he, he had an impact. Movie. You know, I was movie. scared because of that brain character with the spiky arm, you know. Mm -hmm. It may be real and in a tree stump. So I, I, I missed out on all these great... I love Clash of the to Titans, see. too, and that the one was one pretty bad. One? No, the old one. I loved the old, the old one, one with the owl and everything. Loved it. And oh, my then, gosh, yes. And Sinbad with those terrible, terrible um, the, skeletons the, and the everything. Harryhausen, the Ray Harryhausen stuff. <laughs> yeah. It was awful, yeah, but it was lovely they're, they're at the same so time. Good, they're, they're so bad, they're good. But, you know, yeah, uh, yeah Calabos. Remember Calabos? Uh -uh, he was the, the brother of the, the, the weird brown dude with the pitchfork. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yes. Clash of the Titans. Yes, Titan. now I know. Yeah. I have those toys, and I still have some of those toys. I had that one. Did you really? Yeah. I, I love Clash of the Titans Clash of the toys. Titans toys. This is a stream of consciousness, guys. This is fun. <laughs> we do this all the time. We're terrible. It's called Geek Out SA. Normally no when our producer's here, he's telling us to stay on task, and he's like, stop it, stop it. <laughs> yeah. go, back to, go back to Phil's movie. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, but, but we're having a so, conversation. So, yeah, the documentary. Vince? Yeah. So, it's, it, it's, uh, it's all done and ready to go? You know, they're, what, they're putting the finishing touches on the film and uh, coming up with the launch dates and strategies. But, you know, they announced at the panel, and this is not a hard set, but they're looking at, you know, sometime between now and the end of the year. Oh, wow. Um, but it's going to be it's gonna be great. It really is. I mean, what was really cool is after the panel, all the, the panelists were mobbed by the press. You know, we were out in the hallway behind the panel, and the press was like... You know, and then they're like, hey, we got another panel coming in. We all need to, the guy that's one of the programming guys at San Diego comic Con's like, you guys need to take this back to the green room. So it's like, you know, all the cast that was on the panel is going down the hallway in the bowels of the San Diego Convention Center. And we go into the green room, continue all the press stuff. And it, there are no photos and video in the press room. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, all this press comes in because it's the green room. It wasn't the press right, room. Right, you're it was supposed the green to be room. like relaxing. Or and all of a sudden, people are yelling like, "You can't shoot in here!" And publicists are yelling at me because I'm the one guy that's not in front of the camera. <laughs> you know what is just what's the meaning of this? And I'm like, "Listen, we were told by the programming people to bring the pre these press to the green room and do the interviews here. We're just following instructions, you know." And it bought us enough time <laughs> to finish the interviews. Wow. But uh, it was great. And then after that, we were whisked away to the uh, Variety Yacht, a three-story yacht. 
where they were shooting I mean, interviews and stills of the <laughs> cast members and Spencer and George. And, uh, you know, uh, then we were moved over to the IMDb yacht where we did the same thing there. And it became like a pre... I, I thought, were the panels going to be over at 11 and then I'll be hanging out at Comic-Con by noon. But we had... It was all day wow. into the evening. And finally, you know... It, it, we were at Yahoo, and we were at Sci-Fi, and it was just everybody wanted to talk about this because this is the ultimate sci-fi horror comic book fan documentary. So why wouldn't they want yeah. to cover it? Mm -hmm. You know, hosted by Captain Sulu, George Takei. Takei, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, and, and it's got to be so surreal to be in that atmosphere it was surreal for me, you know, because I'm just a producer. I'm yeah. helping make some things happen on the movie. But, you know, before the panel, the night before the panel, I was talking to our director, Spencer F. Lee, and I've known him for years. In fact, I really got to know Spencer over Toy Biz X-Men figures. We both collected Toy Biz X-Men figures back in the day, and he's like, dude, you got to come see my collection. Mm -hmm. He's got, like, tons of them, and we became very good friends over that. But I was talking to him the night before the panel, and I said, Spencer, your life is going to change tomorrow. You're the opening panel of San Diego Comic-Con. Wow. 4,000. I guarantee you that there has never been a documentary with a producer from San Antonio that's opened San Diego Comic-Con. There's never been a, a film with a director from Monroe, Louisiana that's opened San Diego Comic-Con. There's never been a film with an executive producer from Atlanta, Georgia, that's opened San Diego Comic-Con. I mean, that is like there is winning now. an Oscar. That's like <laughs> yeah. winning an Oscar because yeah. that is the that's most the prime fandom real estate in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It yep. really is. Yeah. And we opened San Diego Comic Con, and it and 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 so I cannot wait for you guys to see this documentary. That's going to be awesome. So I have so a awesome. kind of an off-task question, I guess. But since you were the producer, um, and a lot of my students watch, is there something that you can put yours down a little put my bit? My down my your I'll volume. Just, I'll just talk softer. Is there something you can tell like my students about who watch the show? about what it is, what it means to be a producer and what exactly that is that you would do for a film. You know, it's kind of funny. A lot of people think a producer is somebody sitting in a big office smoking cigars and drinking scotch, you know, and some of them are. But, you know, producers are people who help make sure the movie continues to move forward. And you do any job, whether it's hold, you know, a water bottle for a cast member that's doing an interview or or you know set up an interview like for me is setting up the Stan Lee interview that's probably the biggest thing I did on the movie mm -hmm. is I made the Stan I got the Stan Lee interview so you kind of like a project manager almost kind of -ish? all of the above yeah <laughs> you're a publicist you're a project manager you're a go gopher you're a encourager you know it's it's it really is it, you know, different producers do different things. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I know for me working on this project, it's really just being supportive. In fact, you know, I've, I've helped uh, with some of the visual effects stuff on the show and kind of trying to find artists to help us do things. And, and you know, it's, it's all over the place. But it really, you know, you're, a producer is somebody whose job, and this is my definition of producer, make sure it gets done and it looks good and and the director has everything he needs you're an assistant to the director in a big in a, in a big way oh, that makes you sense. know whatever spencer needs you know whether it's you know make sure so and so's here go find somebody go do this you just get it done hold a camera make sure people are signing their release forms whatever it takes make the movie successful you know you know make sure the director has what he needs so he can do his job and so, you know, we've got, we're documenting the history of fandom here, and it's, it is really nice to have the front row seat. Yeah. I can't wait to see it. And how, how much footage you it was taken through all of this? Oh, my gosh. I don't even know how many hours it is, but it's way more than we can use. Wow. I mean, we interviewed 30 people for the documentary. I mean, uh -huh. think about it. If you do an in-depth interview with 30 people, yeah. you know, right. and cut it down to a feature film length, mm -hmm. 
you're going to leave a lot of good stuff on the cutting room floor. Yeah, wow. you're just getting like a tiny portion of what they had to say. So yep. maybe a part two, part three, part That six. is up to Spencer <laughs> F. Lee. Yeah. <laughs> it depends on how, if he survives this process, you know. I mean, no, he'll survive. He's, he's working his tail off. The guy has given up sleep to try wow. to make this happen. It's going to be the uh, new trilogy. <laughs> yeah, I, I, would love, I would love that. That would be fantastic. But yeah, we've got so many good interviews. I mean, like we've interviewed Howard Rothman mm -hmm. from Lucasfilm, the guy who did the licensing deals on all the Star Wars stuff since the beginning. Wow. Joe Dante, you know, oh my gosh. It is, it is I mean, it is a Nerds Paradise movie. <laughs> Yeah, so it's it's exciting. I'm I'm just honored to be a part of it. I'm glad Spencer called me and said, "Hey, man, I need your help." I was like, "Sure." It goes back to the what we were saying. So open the door. You know, so many people sit around and wait for the perfect thing, mm -hmm. or they wait until they're asked. But you have to just go ahead and start preparing yourself to be ready for that open door. And so when it opens, you run through it. And that's what I did on this. Is Spencer was like, would you be interested? Like, yes, the answer yes, is yes. yes. What do I need I'm to do? I'm coming right now. I'm on my way. But you got to do that with like a lot of things. I do. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Well, I am insane. But you were saying before, and we were talking about this before too, it's also about building relationships. Um, you build those good relationships because then you might be that person who can connect this person to that person and make this thing happen, right? So yes. you build those relationships. Well, I had the relationships to, to get into with Stan Lee. Right, I mean, exactly. you know, I've helped with some stuff for Stan. And, uh, you know, and it opens the door. Just, you know, the, the moral of the story to me is don't be a douchebag and help people. There you you go. know, just help people <laughs> because you never know. You know, you, it, 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 when I was talking, circling back ADD circle. No, that's fine. At the Art <laughs> Institute graduation. You know, one of the, my talk was the power of yes. Mm -hmm. You know, because all these kids are graduating from art school and film school and culinary school. And, you know, I was like, you know, how many of you guys have a day rate? Everybody's raising their hands, you know. It's like, okay, where, how many people have updated your demo reel in the last two months? And half the hands went down. And I'm like, you got to earn your day rate. You got to go out and say yes to everything you can mm -hmm. until your schedule's full. And then you start picking and choosing your gigs. But every one of those yeses, even if it's a non-paid internship or if it's a, a PA gig on some film where they're going to give you free food in exchange for helping, you're building your credits, you're building your yes. network of people. And if you're somebody that works hard and they're smart and get stuff done, they're going to be like, dude, we're calling you for the next one. And hopefully you've built your network well enough. They're like, look, I'm really busy. I'd like to work with you but here's what I need, but you've earned the respect to earn the rate. But you're telling them the opposite of what social media and the internet and everything is telling them. They're like, don't let people use you, don't take the free gigs, like they're just using you to get stuff That's out of you for attitude. free. That is a bad attitude. Mm -hmm. It's not getting them anywhere. It's not getting them any expertise. It's not getting them any practice. You don't just come out of college like, ready you, you know don't. that telling him don't let people use you is a loser attitude because and I, not to be mean and call anyone a loser but a loser attitude is when you 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 take a victim card you know mm -hmm. oh they're using me they're taking advantage of me instead empower yourself to learn something that's going to propel you to what's next yes you know, you take that gig and maybe they are getting, some, they should have paid you a hundred bucks a day or two hundred dollars a day and they're not paying you anything, but look, what are you going to get out of it? Mm -hmm. If you right. go into a gig and you do it for free and you get a credit and you get a knowledge or you're working under somebody that actually knows what they're doing and you learn from them, right. that is your value. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it also fills your dance card so that next time they call you and want you for a free gig, you're booked. Yeah, you know, but it's it's interesting. The power of yes. I mean, I'm I'm thinking about writing a book about the power of yes because there are so many books about how to say no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, but uh -huh. and, and maybe saying yes could be a bad thing, but if you if you leverage it in the right way, yes. is the key. Exactly, that's if you the key. can let people walk all over you and be a victim, but if you kind of change your mentality about it and 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 see what am what what why am I'm going into this 
What am I going to get out of it? Mm -hmm. How am and I going to use this to better myself? It's just like, yeah. you know, I volunteered as a favor to Apple mm -hmm. to run press for Alamo City Comic Con. Mm -hmm. You know, if I'd have been billing for that, he would have had to pay me about 20 grand to do what mm -hmm. I did. You know, that's, and, the, and for 20 grand, if you'd have hired a PR firm to do it, you wouldn't have got a third of what I did for 20 grand. Mm -hmm. Because I hustled, and I got Alamo Comic Con in Time Magazine. I got them in the New York Times, I think, and Rolling Stone. Mm -hmm. You know, and wow. people pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for that kind of PR. Yeah. And but it was really about hustling. Yeah. Because when I came in to do PR, they had no nothing organized on press. Mm -hmm. And so I went to all the managers and said, "Hey, we want to drive traffic to get your autograph signings on Saturday and Sunday." So. I need your client to come in and do interviews with the local press so that they can hype it and, and tell people that so and so's in town. Right. Yeah. And you guys were there. We I mean, were. That's where we met. <laughs> yeah. That's where we that met. That was you where know, we met. Y'all interviewed Stan Lee. Yeah. Yep. You know, mm -hmm. and, and, and but the key is, is just, you know, I could say, oh, well, man, I should have been paid for that. I was like, no, guess what? I got to know Stan Lee's people. Mm -hmm. Right. And right. then next thing you know, I'm doing a documentary and Stan's doing it. That's what he did to better there himself. There you go, and there you go. <laughs> the key is, is how you leverage these opportunities. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and From the Bridge is, is the same thing. I mean, Carrie O'Quinn, um, you know, and he talks about this in the Comic-Con panel, you know, he was doing magazines in New York and he was doing soap opera magazines. Really? Yes, and wow. they created the Soap Opera Awards, which turned into the Daytime Emmys, and Carrie O'Quinn, who started Starlog and Fangoria, did that, but he said, we need to bring, he wants to do this magazine called Starlog that will bring the sci-fi community together, and the publisher was like, there's no way you're going to have an audience to do a monthly, I'll give you a quarterly. So Starlog number one was a quarterly, uh -huh. but by the time, it I think at the third or fourth issue, I think he said, it was like, fans were these were flying off the shelves and they moved to a monthly magazine but he was in the right place at the right time with the right idea and built his network and built mm -hmm. his street cred and now he's and he is the he's one of the guys who helped create fandom as it is today and talking about building stuff you also have a company here in San Antonio yes. called Nelco Media segment. so can you tell us a little bit more about what Nelco Media does yeah um, you know I I am a live TV guy Mm -hmm. You know, I've worked in live television, live production for 30 years, I think. What, I don't even know. I think it was 1990 that I started in live wow. TV. So I was pretty young. And, uh, and I was at a company called New Tech for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And New Tech uh, created Lightwave 3D, which is the 3D animation mm -hmm. software that did Titanic and Battlestar Galactica and, and Avatar and... You know, Star Trek and R2-D2 in episode one, when he flies his light wave and Amidala's ship when it lands on Tatooine. And, but this 3D software, and they're based here in San Antonio, and they also do this device called TriCaster. Go San Antonio. People, it's a cooler <laughs> town than most people realize. But it is. I was an executive there for 20 years, and then I saw an opportunity. I left after 20 years and started Nelco Media, and mm -hmm. I wanted to approach the live video process and just video production process from more of a 360 degree view I sell this equipment mm -hmm. but what happens in broadcast equipment is people will go buy a TriCaster from some mail order company and then get it and need help or not understand it and who do they call? Well, they'll call the manufacturer so I said I want to create a company where we really are focused on the 360 degree view of this mm -hmm. process so it's you know, we, we just built out a studio in the city of San Angelo yeah, where we designed their that, sets, yeah. we designed their lighting, we designed their control room, we trained them and we installed it and we deployed it. So it's like, it's like the w ultimate wingman for anybody wanting to do live. But we do like Sony Panasonic cameras, we do live view Teradek, you know, nice tripods like, uh, you know, Sackler, Vinton, Manfrotto, you know, high-end tripods and... Lights, cameras, everything you need, you know, it. graphics, streaming, whatever. Yeah, when I go over there, I geek out over their equipment. I, when I go over there, I'm just confused. I'm like, what? I'm just like, what? There's too yeah, many buttons. And so we're based buttons. here in San Antonio, and we yeah. bought a building downtown. And, 
which you know, is gorgeous. And I'll tell you, you know, we should do a Geek Out SA meetup at Nelco. Yeah. Yeah. Because I bought this old Victorian mansion built <laughs> many, sweet. many years ago. <laughs> and I want to bring together the community, the video community specifically, but I've seen I, with From the Bridge maybe the, the geek community as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's just a cool place where I want cool people to get together, hang out, network. Well, maybe Vince should bring his um, YouTube because they have a San Antonio YouTube. Well, he's actually group. talked at at the uh, yeah. at the group. Maybe they should come they over to your place. They were desperate for a speaker one night, and then and he calls <laughs> and goes, "Hey, what are you doing tonight? Our speaker canceled." I was like, "Okay, you had me at hello." <laughs> <laughs> I like to because do stuff. Phil has no stories to tell anyone, we, we, so why would he want to speak? We had that set up for a long time. <laughs> Tough crowd. I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, you know, but I mean, I I think we should do. I want to do more stuff to bring communities that I like together in San Antonio. <laughs> What's that like? hey, that's right, the we're key. We're supposed to be inclusive. Well, I everything. can be inclusive of anything I like. <laughs> <laughs> okay, look. if it's comic books, <laughs> sci-fi, horror. What about anime? I love anime. What about tabletop gaming? I love tabletop gaming. Okay, see, all the good things. I'm just saying, if I like it, it's included. <laughs> if you like it, no, it's okay. No, a cool thing is I had a great opportunity. Lightwave 3D, when I was at New Tech, was huge in Japanese anime. Hmm. And so I'm a huge Tezuka fan. I've never seen Tezuka. Uh, he created Astro Boy. Oh, okay. Okay. So I, Lightwave was used on one of his movies called Metropolis. So I geeked out on that. And then uh, Steam Boy was Lightwave. And then uh, Studio, uh, what are they called? Uh, Gonzo. So Ghost in the Shell Ghost 2, the Blood the Last Vampire, Last Exile. I mean, all these shows were done in New Tech Software, Lightwave 3D. So I got to go over to Japan, and I, need, I was going to meet with all these artists and stuff. Wow. And what was really cool is, so I, did, I didn't understand the, the hospitality of Japanese culture. You know, they are the most gracious culture on the planet. So I didn't know that if a guest asks for something, they almost have to say yes. Okay. So I'm the coming in, I'm like, oh my gosh, I want to go to the Hayao Miyazaki Museum. Okay. I love Studio Ghibli. I just was one of my favorite anime mm -hmm. uh, studios. And I was like, I really want to go to that. And he was like, okay, Philip's son. And so I show up, like, we're going to the Hayao Miyazaki Museum. And I'm at their office. I was like, you're getting to go. I've never been. It's like a year waiting list for tickets. So I feel really bad that Yoshi <laughs> Abe, Yoshi-san, if you're watching, you're awesome for taking me to the Hayao wow. Miyazaki Museum. But it's a year waiting list for tickets, and somehow he finagled tickets, and I got to go geek out oh my God. at That's the Hayao Miyazaki Museum. Yeah, and I That's always amazing. go, I would stock up on Microman. You know the toys Microman? Uh-huh. Do you remember Micronauts in the U.S.? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Microman is the Japanese equivalent, so I would always take an extra suitcase when I would go to Japan wow. because I knew I was coming back with a full <laughs> suitcase full of toys and other assorted nonsense. Nice. Puzzle well, boxes, you know, anything with Totoro on it, cat bus for the kids. <laughs> All my kids have dust bunnies in, on their beds and not the kind that are natural, but the, the yeah. ones from... Uh, <laughs> Studio Ghibli movie. So yeah, that, but let's let's bring together all the cool kids and let's have some fun. Yeah, I'm totally down for that. It's a really cool spot. Really cool. And I mean, I even had a Warhammer experience. Really? I did. I was at Toy Fair in New York, which is like the epi it's like, you know, the epicenter of all the new toys and mm -hmm. that's where they announce them and buyers are buying them for the Christmas season. Yep. And uh, I was at the uh, uh, the booth for, it wasn't Games Workshop, it was, uh, who makes Warhammer? Citadel. Is it Citadel? It's no, I thought Workshop. it was Games Workshop. Games Workshop. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I was okay. like, I so, think oh, it is right. Games Workshop. Yes, yeah. it is. I was thinking that's the store, but they have their own store. So yeah. I was at the Games War Workshop Machine booth. Are you War Machine are you talking about, maybe? Was, uh, no, this was Games Workshop. Okay. So, so I, I'm, I'm just looking at all their p figures and how amazing they're painted. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to this guy. I'm like, dude, that is amazing. I could never do that. And he was like, yes, you could. Sure you can. And I was like, no, dude, I don't have the patience. He goes, no, you, you've never been taught the right technique. And uh, I was like, yeah, whatever. He goes, come with me. He pulls me in their conference room, opens up a pack, hands me some paints and brushes, and says, 
start from the details to the big stuff, you know? So it's like, do paint it all black, and then do this, and then you do dry brush. And I had this figure that looked amazing, <laughs> with little glints in its eyes, and I was like, what just happened? But it's like, well, that's one of the cool things about people that like you know this this the geek culture they'll share mm -hmm. it is they yeah. they're just they as excited it. about getting you excited than showing i'm better painter than you you know yeah. they're like now there are people that are great painters that no one could touch right. but it's like they want you they want you to get as excited as they are and dude after after toy fair I'm like going back buying some Warhammer and I'm painting Tyranids and, <laughs> and Space Marines and Nice. And then at New Tech even, you know, it was kind of cool because I figured, you know, it was so easy to do. I mean, now there once you once you get to this easy point, there's ways to make them insane. Right. You know, but just getting well, you something don't realize that good the layers on the shelf. that are raised so that it makes the painting like they've thought it through really well so yes. that it makes the painting even for a novice really pretty simple. You can really not mess it up too much and I yeah. don't think people realize that. But the just the different layering that they have on the models and the way that they have some things sticking out and some things that don't. Yeah. It it you can you paint can it dry and brush. It's really cool. But so we actually did painting classes at New Tech. Wow. Nice. <laughs> Where I would go to Games Workshop store on 1604 and buy a starter kit of, what are those metal robots that look like the Terminator? Do you know them very well? No, we're not no. Warhammer okay. people. So whatever they were, Necromancers or that Necromicrons or something, uh -huh. I don't know. But they were these metal robots and I would I, I would say, okay, 12 people, you get, let's paint figures. And we would sit down at lunch at New Tech and paint figures. And then we did Space Marines and... But it, and it was it was like you know our new tech's creative director, right? And she's an adult, not a teenager. You know, she's like just like well, I want to learn this, and I never would have guessed she would wanted to, wanted to do this. You know, she comes from the ad agency business, but she's like in their painting. We had people from accounting in their painting Warhammer at New Tech. We even had at New Tech. I, this is stream of consciousness, but we were officially sanctioned hero clicks venue for a while really wow. yes because uh, before they were purchased by wizards of the coast mm -hmm. um they were using lightwave to design some of their stuff so i got to know one of the guys at at hero clicks and i'm like hey man we love hero clicks at new tech we want to get set up as an official gaming site and he was like well it has to be open to the public i'm like fine we'll post them on the wizards of the the, the hero click site and if somebody wants to come into the tournament they can and we did. We had great tournaments at New Tech, and we oh had we they would send us the wow. bronze base figures as tournament deals, yeah. and we'd give them to the winners. And you know, so yeah, I've been a geek for a long time, but I, I have one <laughs> other geek story to tell you. Okay, one more. This is super geek. <laughs> <laughs> when I was fifteen, have I told you this story? No, I don't think I've uh, heard any kid Phil stories. When I was fifteen, I went to my dad. My brother and I went to my dad, and we said, "Dad, we need to borrow five thousand dollars." We want to start a comic book store. And my dad is an MBA and engineer and, you know, businessman, has successful business. And he drilled us on our, why do you want to start a comic book store? Why do you think it'll sell? Blah, blah. He gave us all, you know, those business plan questions. Right. And he said, okay, fine. You can, we're going to, I'm going to loan you five grand. You can start a comic store. So then my brother and I go to the local mall in North Louisiana and meet with the mall manager and say, listen, we want to start a comic book store in your mall, but we have some catches. We are in high school, we are in junior high, so we can't be open in except when school's out. And in most malls, you have to be open during mall hours. I said, but our clients are also in school, so you need to make an exception. And then we were like, and also, we can't afford mall rent, so we offered him a cut. Mm -hmm. And he said yes. Really? And so we opened this comic book shop in 1987, and we did very well. That was a very good, it was comics and cards, so baseball cards, comic books, and we, we said we're the babysitter of the mall. When moms bring their kids to the mall, they're going to give them $5, they're going to drop them off at Card Co. Now we have Nelco, see, there's a <laughs> long history of Co's. Um, but Card Co. was the name of the shop, and uh, they drop their kids off, their kids sit there for hours. And that was our pitch to the mall. It's like, listen, if the kids come to Card Co., the moms are going to spend more time shopping. 
because the kids aren't hiding nice. in the bra rack at Dillard's, <laughs> jumping out and scaring people. Right. Or, Where are you? And they're like, ah, I'm a living bra, you know. <laughs> so we used to uh, do that kind of stuff. I know. Y'all don't know. I hit, how many you hit? Did you yes. hide in the clothing racks? Yes. Yeah. We all did it. Yes. We so did it. It was that a thing. was our pitch to the mall: is that you will have less kids hiding in the clothing racks. And so we started this comic book shop, and it did very well. And I, we amassed a pretty good comic collection That's in the glory years of comics. I mean, you know, it, I don't know if you saw my post on uh, Facebook about the comics I dropped off for grading. Yes, I did. Did you look what I had in there? Yeah. It was a good. It was, it was just some premium stuff I took. Yeah, just a little bit. I'll make you guys wonder what it is. Yeah, you don't get to know. Online. <laughs> it, one of them was a Spidey number one. I'll yeah. tell that. Wow. That's the one. <laughs> That's like one of my holy grails. I do have one regret from my comic book shop days, and I, I'm sorry I'm dominating this with stupid <laughs> no, stories. it's okay. <laughs> we used to go around as little kids, and I mean, we were on NBC World News tonight because it was a novelty for kids to start businesses in mm -hmm. the 80s. Nowadays, right. every kid's an entrepreneur, and they're on the web and it's easy but you know right. we were like anomaly you know and so even Beckett magazine which is the card collectors book did a story on us but we would travel around buying stuff at comic shops and I and I, this comic guy in New Orleans would always cut me good deals on golden age and silver age books so that because he, he, he liked me because I was this kid mm -hmm. but he said you need this stuff in your shop because people want to see this. They may not buy this, but they want to come in a shop and see something cool, and then they're going to buy the new issue of Amazing Spider-Man. Right. So I, he was like, you need this book, and it was $800 in 1987. I was like, dude, I'm not buying an $800 comic book. And it was Amazing Fantasy 15. Go how, look up what an Amazing Fantasy is. How much is that worth? See how much it's worth now. That. I mean, it wasn't meant... So I would say today it's probably it, that that condition that it was in would probably be worth like twenty five thousand dollars. But you know what? Hindsight's twenty twenty, and the things that got away wow. make you will love it even more. You know, so I mean I can't talk because when I was a kid, I actually took a bunch of my cards and poked holes in them made and put necklace. yarn and made a necklace, and I would wear my cards to school more as a cards. necklace. I was a football girl back really? then. Yeah, so I had um, a lot of the Cowboys, and I had like Roger Staubach, and a lot. So of you that you have stuff. the perforated. So do you still I have the cards? Uh, no. See, I mean, it's the but you know. I, I should have kept them, but my brother was mad, and he threw them away. Oh. My brother's been on two episodes lately for throwing away my stuff. Oh. Uh, he got rid of my strawberry shortcake yeah. and He-Man figures. Um, I just found that out last week. I because I we did a toy show so i was calling him I'm like dude i know this is in your storeroom because i let your kids borrow this he stuff when they away. were little. he was like yeah no i think i gave that like to goodwill or something he man stuff's worth some money now i don't even care i just loved it i wanted it back. you know though <laughs> you know I, it, it was funny even in the 80s you would have people come up to the shop and say you know because we had a mickey mantle rookie uh -huh. the 52 tops mantle rookie which wow. it's worth a lot of money too yeah. i still have it um, sealed away in a secret vault somewhere, you know. But we uh, people we, we had those cards out because people would want to come see them, and they'd be like, "I had that card when I was a kid, and I put it in my bicycle spokes to make them click." Oh, yeah. But that's what makes stuff truly valuable is that nostalgic view. Right. It's mm -hmm. like exactly. I had that as a kid. I mean, how many toys have you f went and bought because you had them as a kid? Have right. you done that? Right. Like, well, I'm trying not to because I buy new stuff. But now that I found out about Strawberry Shortcake and He-Man, I may have to go and at least get a, a couple of... You need a and He-Man. That's what I think. I need Strawberry a couple Shortcake of the pieces. Strawberry Shortcake and Blueberry Pudding or whatever her name was. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember their names. What was her name? Blueberry it, something. I, I like Well, that I want Strawberry Shortcake and Huckleberry great. Finn. That was the little boy and he oh, had really? the little hat. And he, yeah, so I like I Huckleberry, Huckleberry Finn and Strawberry Shortcake. I expensive because they didn't like... It's kind of like, like he was in, the only boy. He's like well, Smurfette for the Smurfs. See, it's like in the Star Wars world, you know, they didn't make as many of the girl figures. Yeah. You know, and so the girl figures are the chase figures. And I would think in Strawberry Shortcake, the boy figures are the chase figures. I bet you Huckleberry Finn costs a fortune. That's my prediction. Let's He's look him up Goodwill. one day. He's at Goodwill somewhere or at somebody's house now, I guess. And that's why we buy a lot of the pops because of the nostalgia factor. And it's like 10 bucks. Dude, can I be controversial? Yeah. I did yeah, a post today that was controversial. I and saw I that post. Stuff up. Uh oh. What did you think of my post? You think I'm an idiot? You can say it. No. I made a I don't prediction think so. that, that Funko Pops are the beanie babies of this generation. 
because... I can see that. Every, I, I can mean, see that. And I mean, if you buy something because you like it, who cares if it's right, worth $2,500? But That's at San Diego Comic Con, I saw these people buying Funko Pops for like 1000 bucks and 1500 Dude, $1, and people bucks. were saying that they, had, they would go to get in line because you have to get in line to get a ticket to get into the Funko booth to even try to get those $1,000. Right. And some of them tried all weekend, finally got in the last day, and then they were sold out. And you have wasted your weekend and not enjoyed Comic-Con. Yes! And so that was my post today. And, dude, I didn't expect to get you some got all hostility. The haters. <laughs> Just people like, you're wrong. You know, I'm like, you know what? That's just my opinion. But I, I mean, I, if you like, because I, I, my favorite Funko I have, I have the Swamp Thing that glows. Nice. Oh, okay. I love the Swamp Thing. I love Man Thing. And I love those characters. And mm -hmm. you know what? I don't care if it's worth any money. Yeah. You know, like yeah. the Baby Groot Funko. Mm -hmm. That is a great Funko pop. Yeah, yeah. But I, I just think from an investment perspective... In 20 oh, years, no, yeah. will people be paying oh. five thousand dollars for a no fun way. coat? No way! No, I don't. They flooded see that. the market with too many. Of maybe them, a couple of this. Maybe a couple of the specialty ones but that you could only get at Comic Con, or you could only get at Top But will people actually pay for it? That's the key, because a collectible is only worth what you can get for it. And but I don't think in 50 heard... years there's going to be heritage auctions for the Funko Pop, like there are yeah. of yeah, some of these old not. collectibles. Because Beanie not. Babies, man, I've got a, some great Beanie Babies, and I'm giving them to the kids because they're not worth anything. <laughs> they're not worth that. But the owner, the the Beanie Baby guy, he, he really messed with the with the product that he had, and said he didn't that he had a limited supply of certain things. That's why it would sell out, and he was manipulating the market with that. It's and a that's, retired kind of stuff. That's the why stuff. they started not being worth anything. We'll see. Because he messed with I love that. Funkos. So, so I do buddy, love them. One of my buddies yeah. from Ace Comic Con, we got to go? Oh, yes, we've yeah, gotta we got to go. But <laughs> <laughs> well, we got some, uh, got, uh, Retro Crunch says, God, I hate pops. Yep. Oh, God, I hate pops. <laughs> <laughs> Feels like, yes, cha-ching. <laughs> They're too mass produced. Yeah, they are They're too mass, mass produced. produced. Yeah. Um, uh, I have the sign Stan Lee. I don't have the sign Stan Dude, Lee. Dude, see, that yeah. is a collectible. That is a collectible. One, if you got it signed by Stan Lee, now you have this memento yeah. of your experience showing it to Stan Lee, talking to him. But see, that becomes something where you almost... You I mean, for me, it. I would never sell it. I would we can, never sell it. We could it. probably talk for like another two hours, oh, but we can't. Okay, we <laughs> so, gotta stop. Phil, thanks for coming in. I really, really enjoyed this show. We got to get you back on again. It's, this we is could talk just forever. Great. We could talk forever. I'll come back anytime. <laughs> we'll geek out. And I'll bring toys with me. Yes. And I'll awesome. bring my Spidey one and hold it up. And <laughs> it's, it, it, I, I'm getting it graded, and it'll probably be a, like a 0.5, but we'll see. Still worth something. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for uh, checking us out. I'm Vince. And I'm Colleen, and I'm trying to do this Steam Deck, Stream Deck thingy at the same time. And this is Phil. <laughs> and back to Vince. <laughs> Geek out, I say. See you later. <laughs>